on behalf of Cambridge Innovation Institute's Global Web Symposia series and our sponsor, Biomodels LLC, I'd like to welcome you to customized end-to-end -end solutions to explore the microbiome in preclinical research. My name is Elizabeth Lamb, and I'm the host and moderator for today's webinar. Now I would like to introduce our presenter for today. She is Caitlin S.L. Perello, PhD, Associate Director of Research Operations with Biomodels LLC. Welcome, Dr. Perello. The web symposium is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Caitlin Perello, and I'm the Associate Director of Research Operations at Biomodels. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to listening to me speak today. The title of my talk is Customized End-to-End -end Solutions to Explore the Microbiome in Preclinical Research. I'm going to start with a quick introduction to Biomodels for those of you who aren't familiar with us. Biomodels is a preclinical contract research organization located in Waltham, Massachusetts. So we're a little northwest of Boston, a little west of Cambridge. We were founded in 1997 out of Brigham and Women's Hospital and we specialize in highly translational models of human diseases and conditions for a wide variety of clients with therapeutic expertise in inflammation and autoimmunity, microbiome, pulmonary disease, fibrosis, custom modeling, and more. To date, we facilitated over 50 compounds into patients across multiple indications. Uh, the objectives for my talk today, I'm going to start by providing an overview of major areas of preclinical microbiome research and some common questions. I'm going to discuss Biomodel's approach to novel microbiome strategies in preclinical animal modeling. And then I'll finish up by presenting some examples of microbiome-focused research concepts, study designs, and outcomes. The microbiome's impact on health and disease is increasingly appreciated. In our experience, microbiome concepts in preclinical research can be broadly grouped into two categories. The first are those that encompass experiments addressing the microbiome's impact on disease phenotypes, or experiments where we're treating the disease directly by targeting the microbiome. The second are those that encompass experiments addressing the microbiome's impact on the efficacy of small molecules or biologics. In these experiments were treating the disease by increasing test article efficacy by targeting the microbiome. These experiments address the questions. Can microbiome manipulation be therapeutic in a given disease model, or can the microbiome mediate the efficacy of a given candidate or on-market drug? Testing the hypothesis that disease phenotypes or drug efficacy may be mediated by an individual's microbiome, and that changes to the microbiome at either the taxonomic or the functional level can be therapeutic or can modulate drug efficacy. Approaches and considerations in preclinical microbiome research are similar, regardless of whether disease phenotypes or small molecule or biologic efficacy are the primary target. At Biomodels, we've worked with a number of treatment approaches in this space. Um, we've worked with administration of whole microbiome communities, typically fecal microbial transplants or FMTs. Um, these can be mouse-to-mouse -mouse FMTs, and we've also worked with human FMTs, both sourced from healthy human controls, as well as from patients um, with a disease of interest. We've also worked with specific consortias or specific species of bacteria, colloquially known as bugs as drugs. We've worked with strategies intended to manipulate the microbiome through administration of metabolites or small molecules. We work with genetically engineered bacteria. And then we've also worked with strategies intended to manipulate the endogenous microbiome genetically, um, so CRISPR-based approaches. In terms of considerations, the innate microbiome is a major one. Um, so for one, whether the animals have a mouse microbiome or a human one, um, because there can be taxonomic and functional differences between the two. Additionally, the innate microbiome is going to have an impact on the engraftment dynamics if you are dosing bacteria or FMT. Um, and then finally, the innate microbiome is going to essentially absorb the impact of a number of study-to-study -study variables, um, some of which I'll be going into um, a little bit later in the talk. An additional consideration is that of cross-contamination and outside contamination, and specifically how susceptible your experimental system is to these risks. Um, though these are similar concepts, there are nuanced differences um, between the two. And just because an experiment has a high risk of outside contamination does not mean it necessarily has a high risk of cross-contamination and vice versa. 
Um, and we can help with experimental design and defining specific husbandry um, decisions to help mitigate those risks. Um, consistency is really critical in these experiments. It's important to be considering not only the animal vendor, but the barrier at that animal vendor, the chow and water on which the animals are maintained, as well as the housing paradigm when designing um, microbiome experiments. Um, so some questions that were frequently asked include, I'm targeting the microbiome in this experiment. Where do I start and what variable should I be considering? How can germ-free animals be used in my microbiome program? And if I've elected to use conventional animals, should I be pre-treating with antibiotic? If my bacteria are strictly anaerobic and challenging to culture, how should I proceed? Is it even possible for me to outsource and work with a CRO? And finally, what in vitro and ex vivo analyses best complement an in vivo data package in this space? I'm next going to discuss Biomodel's approach to novel microbiome strategies in preclinical animal modeling in the context of those common questions. I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce the Taconic Biomodels Microbiome Initiative, a collaboration designed to help researchers identify an optimum project specific approach. The Taconic Biomodels Microbiome Initiative combines the capabilities of Taconic and Biomodels into a single comprehensive solution. The collaboration offers discounted pricing to encourage the best possible and most rigorous experimental designs. At Biomodels, we understand that every research program is unique and it's our goal to provide solutions. We'll generally start with a conversation in which we'll discuss your disease area of interest, if you know it, your experience to date, our experience to date, and the mechanism of action of your treatment strategy, if applicable. The Biomodels team encourages detailed discussions and consultation aimed at identifying the most appropriate study designs. We're experienced with the replication of published data, and we routinely adapt literature-based methodologies to suit research needs. Experimental approaches can be customized to predefined budgets or limited resources. When targeting the microbiome in an experiment, it's important to consider the following variables, regardless of approach. The first variable includes um, vendor and barrier. Different barriers can have different microbiomes. Um, so for example, um, even at the same vendor, different barriers can have animals that may or may not be colonized with segmented filamentous bacteria or SFB. Um, and SFB have been demonstrated in the literature to be impactful on the appropriate development of mucosal immunity, specifically TH17 cells. An additional variable of which to be mindful is that of food and water, and the food and water that the animals are maintained. Um, the food and water on which animals are maintained can shift the microbiome within animals, um, potentially altering outcomes. And then an additional variable um, that people should be mindful of is that of housing and handling, and specifically the risk of cross or outside contamination, as these risks can guide husbandry decisions. The decisions on how to handle, house, and perform husbandry are dependent on the stability of the animal's microbiome, whether it's reconstituted or endogenous, how susceptible that microbiome is to disruption via contamination, and then how likely that bacteria is to become a contaminant itself, whether outside or within a study. Um, so when we're working with you to help design the experiment, we can help you define your experimental risk profile. So the, in other words, the risk that your experiment may have an infectious risk or how likely it is that the bacteria with which the animals are inoculated may be infectious to other animals. Um, the cross-contamination risk, which is how likely it is that the microbiome of one group may contaminate the microbiome of the next group, may contaminate the microbiome of the next group, et cetera. And then finally, how um, the risk profile of outside contamination. So how likely it is that the microbiome of your experiment may be contaminated by outside bacteria. And we have a number of housing, handling, and husbandry strategies um, to, that are going to be the most suitable for your particular experiment's risk profile. In terms of housing, we have germ-free isolators for germ-free housing, and then we also have barrier conventional and biocontainment vivariums. We can handle animals in those germ-free isolators, and all, as well as in the biosafety cabinet and on the bench top. And we're able to maintain animals with either irradiated or autoclaved materials. Um, generally, irradiated materials are considered sterile, and they're appropriate for most of the experiments that we perform. However, when performing experiments at the germ-free standard, we'll typically encourage the use of autoclaved materials um, instead of irradiated. 
Other factors that, potentially, that can potentially influence the microbiome include the gender um, of the animals, the caging strategy, environmental and social stress, including transport, um, in vivo batch effects, such as, the co such as cohorts and collection time points, the fecal collection method, wet lab batch effects, and your bioinformatics pipeline. Um, as I've said, consistency is critical. Um, it's best to avoid changes in ongoing or follow-up studies. If you've identified a system that is working and that has yielded um, positive data, it's best to keep all of these variables as consistent as you can in the next, next experiment to help maximize the likelihood of that positive data reproducing. Germ-free animals are a powerful research tool when considering the microbiome. They provide a blank slate, eliminating the variable of an innate microbiome and can be used in several experimental approaches. One question that germ-free animals can be used to address is does a specific microbiome or the microbiome generally impact a specific phenotype? An example of an experimental approach would be to start with a cohort of germ-free animals and to inoculate one group with a microbiome of interest and then assess a given readout. Uh, for the purposes of this example, let's say that that readout is expression of a specific gene in the colon. If we see increased expression of that gene in our microbiome inoculated animals relative to our germ-free animals, this would suggest that the presence of a microbiome generally or the presence of a specific species within that microbiome um, is in some way leading to that increased gene expression. Now to help parse apart whether the changes in that gene expression are related to the presence of a microbiome generally versus the presence of a specific species, Another approach would be to, again, start with germ-free animals and this time compare two different microbiomes. And let's say that these two different microbiomes, their only difference is the presence or absence of one species of bacteria. If we see increased gene expression in animals inoculated with microbiome 2 versus animals inoculated with microbiome 1, that would suggest that the gene expression is being driven or in some way modulated um, by the presence of that particular species of bacteria. The use of germ-free animals in this experiment is really critical because it completely eliminates the variable of the innate microbiome. Um, you can know confidently that the only bacteria that are in these animals are the bacteria that you put there. Another question that germ-free animals can be used to address is how does my therapeutic microbiome interact with a representative microbiome? Does it engraft? Does it shift the existing microbiome at either a species or a functional level? And when layered with disease modeling experiments, do these changes result in a therapeutic benefit? An example experimental approach to address this question would again involve, we'd start with a cohort of germ-free animals, and we would start by inoculating them with a human fecal microbial transplant. After the FMT has some time to engraft, we could then inoculate with a therapeutic microbiome and a control microbiome. With this experimental approach, we'd have the opportunity to assess how your therapeutic microbiome is engrafting in the context of a human microbiome, as well as how your therapeutic microbiome shifts that pre-existing human microbiome, again, at either the species or the functional level. If we then layered disease modeling on top of that, we would be able to see whether the therapeutic microbiome's engraftment and the therapeutic microbiome's ability to shift the pre-existing microbiome leads to any kind of therapeutic benefit in our disease modeling experiment. A third question that germ-free animals can be used to address is what is the interaction between my drug and the microbiome? And can the efficacy of a small molecule or biologic be impacted by individual to individual microbiome heterogeneity at either the species or functional level? The approaches for this question are similar to those um, discussed for the first question, but with the additional component of test article dosing. So the first example approach, we're again starting with germ-free animals, and we're comparing them to animals that have been inoculated with a microbiome of interest. And now we're going to dose with our test article. And let's say our readout of interest is serum levels of that test article. If we see differences in the serum levels of that test article between the microbiome inoculated animals and the germ-free animals, that would suggest that the microbiome in some way is impacting the metabolism of that test article. And then once again, to be able to get at whether these differences are due to the presence of a microbiome generally versus being due to the presence or absence of specific species within that microbiome, 
we would be starting with germ-free animals and comparing test article serum levels um, between two different microbiomes. And again, an important part of using the germ-free animals in these experiments is the elimination of the variable of the innate microbiome. We'll know that the, any differences that we see are being driven by the microbiomes with which the animals were inoculated. All of these experiments can be run utilizing the F0, F1 approach, as well as in the context of disease modeling. By the F0, F1 approach, um, what I mean by that is we would start with a germ-free female and inoculate that female with a microbiome of interest. This female is going to be the female breeder of the F0 generation. We would allow this inoculated germ-free female to breed with a male germ-free animal. They're the F0 generation breeders. And when their progeny are born, the F1 mice, they'll be exposed to that microbiome with which the F0 female was inoculated. This early exposure to that microbiome will allow their immune system to develop in the context of that microbiome. And that's potentially very important. There's a lot of data in the literature demonstrating the importance of early microbiome exposures on the developing immune system. For example, there is data in the literature demonstrating that infants born by C-section are more likely or have a higher risk of developing autoinflammatory, autoimmune, and allergic diseases relative to infants um, born vaginally, and that these differences are related to the different microbiomes um, that the babies are exposed to when being born. Additionally, additionally, there is data in the literature showing that the microbiome can be impactful on T cell education on the in the thymus during T cell development, potentially um, driving the TCR repertoire that the T cell population ultimately has, which again can potentially increase or change the risks of developing autoinflammatory, autoimmune, and allergic diseases. Any downstream experiments would be performed in these F1 animals that have had this early um, exposure to our microbiome of interest and whose immune system has developed in the context of this microbiome of interest. Um, an example of such an experiment, we would have F1 animals exposed to microbiome 1, F1 animals exposed to microbiome 2, induced disease um, in a model of interest, and then dose with test article. If we see test article efficacy only in the F1s that were um, exposed to microbiome 2, but don't see it in the F1s that were exposed to microbiome 1, this would suggest that either the microbiome itself or the way the immune system developed as a result of this microbiome is in some way modulating our test article efficacy. I would also suggest that test article efficacy is related to the microbiome of the animals. These critical tools are accessible via a single collaboration through the Taconic Biomodels Microbiome Initiative. The initiative offers off-the-shelf germ-free mice, germ-free derivations, custom microbiome associations through Taconic's TrueBiome, applicable and translational disease modeling, as well as microbiology, in vitro, and ex vivo services. Through the TBMI at Taconic, any strain can be derived at the germ-free health standard, enabling exciting, exciting downstream experiments. For example, if a given animal strain has a specific phenotype, re-derivation under the germ-free health standard would allow us to assess those phenotypes under germ-free conditions, potentially allowing us to see how that phenotype might change in the context of the microbiome um, as compared to germ-free. Um, it will also allow us to transfer mice to any health barrier. Um, so, for example, if there is a particular strain of interest, but the health barrier at under which they're currently housed um, won't allow their transfer to potentially a more stringent health barrier, rederiving that strain at the germ-free health standard helps overcome that challenge. Additionally, rederivations allow us to generate custom microbiome mouse models, um, which can result in the ultimate in reproducibility, since all of the animals will have the same microbiome. Um, Rederiving a germ-free health standard and generating these custom microbiome models will allow so also allow for exciting mechanistic studies, including the assessment of the impact of microbes on disease models. Humanizing a microbiome is not simply transferring a human microbiome into mice. Immune development in the presence of the human microbiome is critical. In support of this concept is some data from the literature. In this manuscript, the investigators assess CD8 T cell memory feed phenotypes in lab mice and feral mice and compared those phenotypes to those of adult humans and neonatal humans. 
They found that the CD8 T cell memory phenotypes in lab mice were more like that of a neonatal human than they were the, as compared to that of an adult human, and that the CD8 T cell memory phenotypes in the feral mice were closer to those observed in the adult humans. Again, just demonstrating the importance of these early bacterial exposures um, on immune cell development and immune cell phenotypes. If electing to use conventional animals, do you need to pretreat with antibiotic? Well, it depends, and there are caveats. Uh, there are two questions that you'll want to start by answering. The first is, does the efficacy of the microbiome treatment strategy require engraftment? And the second is, are any components of the endogenous microbiome anticipated to impact the efficacy of the microbiome treatment strategy? If your answer to either question is yes, then antibiotic use could be considered. Ideally, you'll aim to rationally select the antibiotic that you're using based on your experimental goals. So for example, whether you're aiming for maximum depletion, species-specific depletion, function-specific depletion, etc. However, if your answer to both questions is no, antibiotic use may not be needed. If proceeding with antibiotic use, there are some caveats of which you should be aware. The first is that the germ-free state cannot be recapitulated through antibiotic administration alone. The taxonomic and functional differences of the remaining murine microbiome after antibiotic administration may have unknown interactions with your therapeutic. A second caveat is that antibiotic administration can impact various phenotypes in fashions mediated by and independent of the microbiome. Piloting may be recommended and well-controlled experiments are encouraged. If your bacteria are strictly anaerobic and can be challenging to culture, how can you proceed? And is it possible to outsource and work with a CRO? At Biomodels, we have an anaerobic chamber, specifically a koi chamber, the use of which minimizes the presence of oxygen during culture or formulation procedures, allowing us to work with these strictly anaerobic bacteria. We're happy to adapt internal protocols for use at our facility, and we encourage upfront validation and optimization experiments to ensure that all methods are functioning as expected. So the first time we culture your bacteria is not going to be the day before the animals are due to be inoculated with it. Um, we'll typically have performed a number of upfront experiments um, to ensure that there's no surprises on the day of the animal inoculation. Biomodels understands the importance of small details. We appreciate specific pro protocols and welcome your team to observe and provide feedback. Um, when working with these difficult to culture bacteria, um, it's important to us that the results that we get in our lab are the same as the results that you get in yours. And so we're always welcoming your team to come and help us troubleshoot if needed. The interactions between the gut microbiome and the immune system are increasingly appreciated. Biomodels has the expertise and equipment to assess endpoints relevant to these mechanisms, including multiplex cytokine analysis, ELISAs and plate-based assays, flow cytometry, cell stimulation assays, cell culture, complex tissue digestion and cell enrichment, including the enrichment of lamin-appropriate lymphocytes from the colon and small intestine, DNA and RNA isolation and qPCR, and custom assay development. Through our collaborations with Dallas Tissue Research and Cosmos ID, our sponsors also have access to histopathology and IHC, as well as sequencing capabilities. So I'll be sending the balance of my talk today, presenting some examples of microbiome-focused research concepts, study designs, and outcomes. The first ex um, experiment that I'm going to discuss is an experiment where Biomodels is aiming to assess how the microbiome generally could impact a specific phenotype. Specifically, Biomodels assess disease development in germ-free animals using the DSS colitis model. This model can be run um, a lot of different ways in the literature. Um, so the way that we run it at Biomodels is that animals are exposed to D DSS in their drinking water for a six-day period from days zero to five. We typically observe the peak of colitis as measured by endoscopy between days 10 and 14. And so some experiments will terminate at that time point as well, particularly if it's important to obtain tissues for histopath at that time point. However, the peak of body weight loss is also typically observed between days eight and 10 and with some recovery thereafter. And for some test articles, the way that we see efficacy is a more robust recovery of that body weight loss. Um, so it can be helpful sometimes to see the back end of that curve and to see the recovery component. 
And those experiments will typically take the study out a little bit longer. Today's 19 and 21, um, and we'll perform a final endoscopy ahead of euthanasia. A cool thing about the endoscopy procedure is that we do not have to euthanize the animals in order to perform endoscopy. So it's possible to use the same cohort of animals for that initial colitis assessment via endoscopy that's performed a little earlier. Um, we don't have to take the animals down, we can use the same cohort. The in-life endpoints in our DSS colitis model include survival, body weight loss, colitis severity score as measured by endoscopy, and colon measurements, so colon weight length and the weight to length ratio. Additional endpoints include histopathology, um, h and &E staining through our collaboration with Dallas Dista Research, as well as assessment of colon cytokines, colon and fecal myeloperoxidase, and fecal lipocalin-2 and calprotectin. So I'm going to start by showing some data um, of how the model typically runs at biomodels when it's um, done in conventional animals. In this experiment, animals were exposed to 3% DSS in their drinking water from day zero to five. We observed the peak of body weight loss in this experiment on day, th on day 10, um, and that peak was at minus 13%, and mean colitis severity score on day 12 was two and a half. Importantly, we observed 100% survival in this experiment, and that's pretty typical. We don't generally observe a ton of mortality in this model. When we induced disease in germ-free animals, we used a 2.5% DSS exposure, but it was again um, exposed exposure on days 0 to 5 in the drinking water. The experiment terminated a little bit earlier on day 10, and this was when the maximum body weight loss was observed at 8%. Um, however, since the experiment didn't go out further than that, we're not sure if the animals would have lost more weight. The mean colitis severity scores at that early time point were comparable between the two experiments, averaging two and a half in both. However, where we saw the major difference when comparing germ-free and conventional animals was in mortality. We saw 70% mortality in germ-free animals that, in which colitis was exposed, and this is compared to 0% mortality when done in conventional animals. This data demonstrates the phenotypic difference between conventional and germ-free animals. However, it also demonstrates the importance of selecting the most appropriate controls for your experimental system. In the DSS colitis model, the germ-free animal is not going to be the most appropriate control, since as you can see from this data, the presence of a microbiome in general um, can impact some of the phenotypes that we're assessing. If we were aiming to assess the efficacy of a therapeutic microbiome, but we compared that microbiome to a germ-free animal, it's likely that we would see an improvement in our mortality readout. However, that based on this data, we would hypothesize that that's due to the presence of the microbiome generally and not related to the presence of the therapeutic microbiome specifically. The more appropriate control would be to compare to an irrelevant microbiome or to first humanize the microbiome of these animals and compare to an untreated control. Um, in the next experiment that I'm going to present, Biomodels was looking at how a specific microbiome could impact a specific phenotype. Specifically, we were assessing Citrobacter rodentia colitis disease phenotypes in animals that were or were not colonized with segmented filamentous bacteria, or SFB, which have been demonstrated to be important for the development of mucosal immunity. In this experiment, we started with a cohort of animals that were from a health barrier that was SFB negative. We prepared an FMT from SFB positive animals and inoculated a subset of our SFB negative animals um, two weeks prior to Citrobacter infection. Two weeks thereafter, the experiment terminated. The end life endpoints in this experiment included survival, body weight loss, fecal Citrobacter load, and colon measurements. Animals that were infected with Citrobacter demonstrated a progressive body weight loss beginning on day 7 and continuing through day 14. However, the animals that were pretreated with the SFB FMT, though they demonstrated an initial body weight loss on day 7, their body weight loss quickly recovered and it was hanging out around baseline at the time that the experiment terminated. When looking at the fecal Citrobacter load, we found that though the Citrobacter load was comparable between the two cohorts of animals on day two, that it was significantly decreased in the SFB FMT pretreated animals on day six relative to the animals that were not pretreated. This led us to hypothesize that the um, improved body weight loss that we observed in the SFB 
um, FMT pre-treated animals may have been related to this more rapid um, citrobacter clearance. Bio models performed another experiment to assess how a specific microbiome can assess um, can impact specific phenotypes. Specifically, we assessed body weight change and other body composition measurements in animals that were treated with either antibiotic alone or antibiotic followed by an FMT. In this experiment, we pre-treated animals with an antibiotic cocktail for five days. And this was an antibiotic cocktail, um, the goal of which was to uh, maximally deplete the microbiome. On day zero, the animals were then treated with either vehicle or FMT that was sourced from a mouse that was not pre-treated with antibiotics. So the intention here um, was to replenish the microbiome. Body weight change was observed in these animals for three weeks. And on day 21, we assessed body composition measurements by dual energy X-ray absorptometry or DEXA. And then we further um, randomized the animals into subgroups. These subgroups were then switched to either a high fat or a control diet. So we were aiming to assess how the um, high fat diet phenotypes would potentially be impacted by our upfront microbiome and, uh, modulation. Animals were observed for six weeks, and then the DEXA measurements were repeated. The in-life endpoints in this experiment included body weight change, body composition measurements, and blood glucose. So looking at the data from the first part of the experiment, we found that the animals that underwent the microbiome manipulation via antibiotic pretreatment demonstrated a significantly increased body weight gain during that um, initial three-week period relative to naive animals. This body weight gain phenotype could not be rescued by the FMT treatment, and it was observed regardless of that microbiome replenishment. When looking at our body composition measurements, we found that bone mineral density, bone mineral content, and bone area were all significantly decreased in the microbiome manipulated animals relative to the naive animals. And again, there was no difference um, regardless of whether the animals were then treated with an FMT. Additionally, lean mass percentage was significantly decreased in the antibiotic and FMT treated animals, and we saw non-significant increases in fat mass and body fat percentage in animals um, in which the microbiome was manipulated. In the second part of the experiment, we were aiming to see how the um, assumed phenotypes of animals maintained on a high fat diet would potentially be modulated by that initial microbiome manipulation. As expected, the animals that were maintained on a high fat diet demonstrated a significantly increased overall body weight gain relative to um, their same cohort of animals that were maintained on the control diet. However, interestingly, significantly increased body weight gain was observed in the animals that were treated with the antibiotic and FMT and, and maintained on the high fat diet relative to naive animals maintained on the high fat diet. So the antibiotic and FMT treated animals, they demonstrated more weight gain, leading us to hypothesize that in some way this microbiome manipulation not only leads to increased weight gain when maintained on normal chow, but also further modulates the high fat diet phenotype. The final experiment I'm going to present today is an experiment where BioModels was assessing the interaction between a test article and the microbiome. In this experiment, we compared tumor growth in germ-free and conventional animals that were sourced from a single vendor, um, so Deconic. And then we also compared tumor growth in conventional animals that were sourced from two vendors, Deconic and Jackson. Um, and this was intended to model two different microbiomes. And tumor growth was compared in both um, with and without checkpoint inhibitor treatment. Animals were inoculated with tumor on day zero, and we began um, checkpoint inhibitor treatment IP a week later, and the experiment tumor terminated approximately two weeks thereafter. The in-life endpoints in this experiment included survival, body weight loss, and tumor measurements. Um, so for the, for the first set of data, we're comparing tumor growth with or without checkpoint inhibitor treatment between germ-free animals and microbiome animals, um, so germ-free animals and conventional. We found that tumor volume was decreased in the germ-free animals relative to the conventional, and moreover, that the germ-free animals did not respond to the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, leading us to hypothesize that the presence of a microbiome is necessary for checkpoint inhibitor efficacy in this model. 
When we compared the tumor growth with and without checkpoint inhibitor therapy between animal source from Taconic and animal source from Jackson Labs as a model of animals with two different microbiomes, we found that the tumor growth kinetics different, differed between the animal source from the two different vendors. And importantly, that only the taconic animals respond to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. This supports the hypothesis that the microbiome can be impactful on the efficacy of checkpoint inhibitor therapy in this system. The taconic biomodels microbiome initiative enables assessment of complex microbiome questions like these. It provides a unique combination of knowledge, infrastructure, and capabilities, enabling investigators to perform proof of concept experiments, literature reproduction experiments, and more with a variety of customizable approaches, including germ-free re-derivation, microbiome humanization, maintenance of proprietary animal strains, disease model optimization, and relevant in vitro and ex vivo assessments. I'd like to thank the take the time to thank the Biomodels team, as well as our collaborators, Taconic, Dallas Tissue Research, and Cosmos ID. Um, and thank you for taking the time to listen to me speak today. Thank you very much, Dr. Perello. We do have some questions that have come in, so let's get started on those. The first one from Eric, can you explain the difference between the terms germ-free and notobiotic? Of course. Um, so these terms, I think, are used a little bit differently depending on the source, but at biomodels, the way that we use them, germ-free would refer to true germ-free animals. So animals that have been maintained under the germ-free health standards, they continue be, to be maintained and housed following our germ-free maintenance procedures. In contrast, notobiotic animals are animals that were germ-free, but were inoculated with a microbiome, whether that's an FMT, or monocolonized with a specific species. Depending on the particular risk profile of that microbiome, notobiotic animals may or may not need to be housed under germ-free conditions. However, germ-free animals universally do require housing under those conditions um, in order to avoid contamination. Excellent. Our next question from Sandra. When working with germ-free animals, do you always house and handle in the isolators or are there different options available? Um, so I think that kind of comes back to the, um, the uh, previous question. Um, so germ-free animals, animals that haven't been inoculated, will nearly universally encourage housing and handling under the germ-free isolators, um, because typically if they're not housed and handled that way, they will become contaminated. However, notobiotic animals, depending on the susceptibility of the microbiome with which they've been inoculated to outside contamination, it may be necessary to house in the isolators, um, and it may not be. Um, we have a lot of different customizable approaches um, to help uh, you basically define which strategy is going to be most appropriate for your system. All right, our next question. Pete wants to know if you could comment on how you monitor isolator experiments for contamination. So when animals are being maintained as germ-free and not inoculated with the microbiome, what we'll typically do is at least once per week, and this can be done more frequently um, depending on the needs of the sponsor. We will um, take samples of the inside of the isolator, including all of the surfaces, as well as a mold trap, which is essentially just crushed up food with some water. And we'll streak those um, on auger plates that are you know, good for growing all bacteria. We'll also um, collect fecal pellets from the germ-free animals and streak those as well. Um, so that's a really easy, just yes, no um, question. If there's any bacteria there, they'll grow. If there's not, they won't. Um, the question gets a little bit more difficult to address when the animals have been um, inoculated with the microbiome. If they're monocolonized, this can still be um, pretty easy to assess, especially if you have any restrictive auger-based um, um, procedures. However, with whole communities, we'll generally encourage um, sequencing, but what this means is that typically we won't know the answer until the experiment concludes. All right, thank you. Our next question, Raymond asks, what's the typical lead time for these kinds of studies? Um, so that can vary. However, I'd say animals that are being maintained not at the germ-free standard, our lead time is generally about a month. 
when being maintained at the germ-free standard, we will um, decontaminate and get all of the isolators prepped um, custom for each individual experiment, and that can add a little bit of lead time. Um, so those experiments are usually more like six weeks. Did you also check fat content in the liver of the antibiotic-treated mice? Um, we did not, um, but that's a great question. I think we would in any downstream experiments. During the course of these experiments, do you monitor microbiome composition regularly? So, so you're spotting any shifts or contaminations with other bacteria? Um, so it's going to vary experiment by experiment, and it's typically dependent on the sponsor's needs as well as the specifics um, of the microbiome with which they've been inoculated. All right, and looks like one of the last questions here. How do you weigh the mice inside the isolators? <laughs> It's a good question. Um, so that also varies experiment by experiment. Um, but if we're maintaining the animals germ-free, um, we'll actually use spring scales uh, that we autoclave. All right, practical solution. And Eva Marie asks, do you have a choice in the mouse strains or do you always use the same one? Um, so I believe that the commercially available germ-free animals are um, C57s, Balbs, and Swiss Websters. However, through the TBMI, any strain can be re-derived re at the germ-free health standard. All right. Okay. Well, we do have a few more questions, but we have come up to the end of our time. So I'd like to thank you so very much to our presenter, Dr. Caitlin S.L. Perello. I'd like to thank our sponsor for today, Biomodels, for sponsoring today's event. And with that, I'd like to say to those of you who came and shared this time with us today, thank you so very much. We know you're very busy and we appreciate you taking the time to be with us. So on behalf of Cambridge Innovation Institute, thank you again, stay safe, and have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.